We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. This time we're in the attic of uh, Joe Wisby, who's... Uh, whose extraordinary collection of Beatles books has been uh, slowly you're posting them on Instagram one a day. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Uh, so how they... many have you got, Joe? What's the sum, what's the sum well, total? I did, I did keep a spreadsheet up until about a year or so ago when I kind of lost, lost track, but it's about 400 at the moment. It's about right. 400. God, it's in that it. kind of, it's in that kind of zone. Yeah. How, how many are there? Have you, uh, it well, must be a listing of how many Beatles books there are. There's talk of around a thousand that have been in print at some point. Obviously, yeah. not all of them are in print now, but there's probably since the first one, which was Love Me Do, Michael Brown, 1964. Since then, um, there's been about a thousand that have, have come out in some form or another. Now, you're clearly, now, as people can see, you're not as old as Mark and I are. So, you know, you're not kind of first generation Beatles uh, fan or scholar no. or whatever. So when did they first enter your your life? Well, thanks to the, the magic of the Radio Times, I can I can actually tell you the exact day because um, this this copy of the Radio Times oh, here, wow. which was from um, uh, June the thirteenth, nineteen ninety two, uh, they obviously celebrated what was then Paul McCartney's fiftieth birthday. <laughs> Um, which got it got a little feature here, and on the on Sunday, uh, you both might remember England played France in Euro '92, oh, um, right. and slightly do a nil nil. Um, yeah. So I was ready to watch this. I was eight in 1992, and previous to to um, that match starting, they showed. I don't know if you can see, uh, they showed uh, help at oh, five really? past two uh, to celebrate Paul's birthday, and. Eight-year-old me was uh, enchanted by that scene at the beginning of Help when they they all jump out of the car and they go into what look, look, looks like four suburban terraced houses and then, of course, it's a playground of excitement in there. Exactly. Yeah. So from that moment, I was, I was hooked. And then later that evening, uh, at half past ten in the evening, way past my bedtime as an eight-year-old, the South Bank show showed uh, a programme about Sergeant Pepper. So I, I kindly asked my mother to record it for me. Uh, she, so she hit play and record on the VCR. And uh, the next day, I was so excited to go home and watch it, obviously, from school. And then I watched this documentary about Sergeant Pepper. Um, I couldn't understand the fact that those guys in Help <laughs> and those guys that were making Sergeant Pepper were the same four the people. Same people. Um, so from that moment, that was when I started to right. uh, fall in love with the Beatles. It is extraordinary that they were the same people. And also those, uh, so when's help? 1965? 65, two years. Uh, so <laughs> so when do they start Sergeant Pepper? Beginning of 67, pretty yeah. much, don't they? You know, yeah. so it's yeah. effectively a year. <laughs> exactly. So my, my eight-year-old head couldn't, I couldn't quite process that. And my 36-year-old head still can't process it. Right, right. So uh, when did you, when did you start getting Beatles books? Well, um, Basically, I um, uh, probably the next weekend, my dad took me into um, Brentwood High Street, which is where I'm from in Essex, uh, and went to Otter Carr's bookshop, and we had a look through the Beatles books there, and <laughs> and he helpfully selected this one for me, um, which I've still got, uh, which is if you can see that, right. an, an unremarkable book, really, um, essentially a picture book by somebody called Arthur. Some I can't remember what the author's called, Arthur Davis. I don't know if, if you know that name, but yeah. Now, this is a very basic, uh, as you can just probably tell by the size and the um, uh, spine, etc. story of the Beatles. Uh, and yeah, this told me essentially what happened uh, between the start and 1970. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, I've, I've got to go on. So yeah, even though this is obviously not of any great depth, it's no, 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 got no. a close, very dear to my heart. As I, as I, it started an odyssey. Perfect like, starter like, pack. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. You see, it's, it, I'm fascinated by this because um, 
you know, for people like Mark and myself who kind of grew up with it, you know, mm. it just ha it was stuff that happened, you know, and only later did you turn it into a story. Yes. Whereas you approached it as a story, didn't you? Because obviously it had taken place in the past. And so it was like any subject of kind of historical interest. So you, your dad just took you and said, that'll tell the story. Yeah, yeah. I think he he was wise not to you know, throw me in at the deep end. That was quite a good start. Of playing yeah, I'm sure that's uh, that definitely. So he uh, was your father a Beatles fan? He was and, and still is. Um, right. Uh, in fact, uh, he after a few years of, of me kind of growing up and still liking the Beatles, he passed something down to me uh, when I was about 11 off the back of something else that I'll show you. He passed me down this book. Uh, oh, well, which I'm sure is familiar to you. Well, both. This on, is... yeah, I have seen it before. Remind me. I don't know that. No. Is that well, this is the Hunter original Davis. Hunter Davis Oh, it's the original, Davis of course. Book. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realise uh, the cover. Yeah, yeah. So I spoke to my dad on Saturday uh, in reference to this. Obviously, we were doing this chat and I asked him where he bought it. Uh, and he bought this, he told me, uh, with a book token that he got for his 20th birthday in 1968 uh, from WH Smith in Liverpool Street Station. Um, so he, he passed this on to me when I was about 11, when I was starting to, um, around the time of the anthology, which we'll, which we'll come to hopefully. Um, and then this, and I was lucky enough, Hunter, I met Hunter and I don't know if you can see, he very kindly signed that for me, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which nice. was, which was nice. And, uh, uh, yeah, so this was, I mean, this is, uh, the only official biography that's that's ever come yes, out. It's an incredible book. Um, it's fantastic. Cause you see it from the inside while it's happening. It's amazing. He, you know, he was there through the um, the Maharishi experience. He witnessed quite a yeah. lot of the, the Sergeant Pepper um, songwriting sessions. Um, it's got its faults and it's quite sanitised, uh, but it's yeah, it's an essential, it's an essential tome, I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. So you met Hunter Davis? Yes, I met. Um, I went to when he did the John Lennon Letters book uh, about ten <laughs> years ago, yeah. and he did a signing session there, and he was obviously quite surprised that. Then 26 year old me had a copy of the 1968 book, yeah. so I, I told him the same story. Yeah, he, he, we had him as a guest on, on Word in Your Ear at a live event, and mm. uh, he was lovely, it was brilliant. But uh, I think he's probably, it's fair to say, his memory might be, you know, it's difficult marshalling, mm. you know, facts, or whatever. Mm. And he has this brilliant technique when being interviewed and goes, and I think at the time the Beatles were working on their fourth album, and then he points at you, and you go, "Oh, Beatles for sale!" And he goes, "That's the one." <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, going, McCartney does pretty much the same oh, thing. Right. <laughs> I interviewed McCartney once. He, he affected to not know which had come out first, you know, uh, Revolver or Rubber Soul, or right, was, you know. yeah. And in some respects, he, 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 we've got a clearer idea of this than he has. <laughs> yeah. It matters yeah. more to us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So when. Did, when did the anthology come along in all well, this? So the anthology actually education. came out, as you remember, uh, in 1995. So I was uh, my first year of secondary school, so I was, I was 11. Um, and actually, uh, I was talking to someone else about this recently. For people of my generation, the anthology was a, a huge uh, kind of watermark because suddenly there was, you know... Uh, there was all this new stuff for a start you know we'd grow we'd had a little bit of that of the um obviously the standard release stuff and they were everywhere and they were a and then a particular magazine came out that that year which really uh, took me deeper into the Beatles and you both may recognize it uh, yeah. because it's this Emoja. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. that's right so uh you your names both appear in this now this this came out as you can see on the front uh, a 70 page fab spectacular um with four different covers I four think. different covers yeah. it was mark yes yeah, so i got this one now this uh, was really the first kind of magazine that i that i got um that had the Beatles on the cover because really through 92 93 94 obviously that was you know mojo q and stuff that they, they did feature the Beatles, but not that often suddenly that that winter they were on every front cover they were on you know um in the in all the papers in even mm, mm. um so there was some fantastic beetle writing in in that magazine uh, and that led me on obviously now i'm a bit older so that led me on to even to go even deeper into uh in, into the beatles literature oeuvre um so yeah that magazine again i've kept that for for obvious reasons it's uh it, it kind of opened a few more beetle doors for me right right and so how were you responding to uh, the contemporary music being made at the time. Were, were you a fan of, I don't know who, 
Nirvana or whatever. Well, no, I went to Oasis. And Oasis Britpop, were, it? yeah, um, Oasis were a group that I, I liked. Um, looking back now, I think some of that might have been a slightly misplaced. Um, but no, that, that music was important. Obviously, a lot, of the, a lot of that Britpop stuff came from that 60s, you know, be it the Kinks or the Who, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, I... I, I, I really enjoy Britpop, but the Beatles were always going to be, um, you know, why listen to, you know, right, right, Oasis right. when the Beatles are there? I can just listen to that, you know. How much of it do you think was to do with the... It, it's interesting because one my son hmm. uh, is probably not far off your age. Um, they started getting obsessed with the Beatles near the anthology. And yeah. I, think it was, I think it was via seeing Hard Day's Night because... They had never seen pop groups acting like that. Right. You know what I mean, having a kind of real life and getting on the train and having adventures and all. And that was a huge part of what appealed to them okay. about the Beatles. It was the kind of monkey side of them, if you like. It, it just looked like they were, in... they were just having the best yeah. time, weren't they? They were just yeah. having more fun than, you know, you didn't really, a lot, of, you know, you mentioned Nirvana there. When you watch videos of Nirvana, as much as it's great music in its own way, you know, they didn't look like they were having a terribly fun time making it, you know. Whereas Hard Day's Night, they were, you know, it, it just looked like the, the most fun you could possibly have, hanging out with your mates, making great music and, you know, being chased by Wilfred Bramble. <clears throat> and you saw long periods of them actually talking to each other, which you didn't otherwise, yeah. did you? I mean, there was no. no documentaries at that time. There was no interviews that really got that across. So you just no. felt they were an incredible gang. Yeah. Uh, right, right. What, what other books have you got there? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, Go on. So uh, there's a, a wide variety of things that I, I thought I'd show you. There's quite a lot of strange Beatles books. So let's have a look at some of those. Um, you get, you get uh, Beatles and a Place. So you get, for instance, things like The Beatles in Ireland. Oh, right. And, oh, then, and then you get The Beatles in Rome. And then you even get The Beatles in Wales. The Beatles in Wales. <laughs> Well, they probably spent, well, Liverpool, you know. Yeah. And yeah. adjacent, isn't it? I'm still, you can get the Beatles in Bournemouth. Um, uh, there's uh, a bit from Magical Mystery Tour, isn't there? Was it, yeah. was it Bournemouth that they go, they spent a day there? I think there's a big photo shoot. Yes. Up on the yeah. cliffs. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, they go to, but uh, anywhere that's got a place, any kind of connection with the Beatles, you'll normally get a book out of it. There's yeah. the Beatles in Bath, which is a book, which you can only buy in, a particular bookshop in Bath. It's not got. A, it's not been published properly. Um, so I did think about going to Bath just to buy the book, but um, my, I've, 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 I've come back from that particular cliff edge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's very funny. Somebody, um, oh, Beatles in Scotland. Scotland as well, yeah. Somebody, somebody posted a picture. Of the, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy does. It posts loads of really good old pictures on Twitter. Um, well, not, not Rob he, Baker. A hey, Rob Baker. Oh, Rob the guy, Baker. The, the picture of them at uh, in Brewer Street was it on the, the corner of Brewer That's Street right. and Rupert Street? Is that, I can't I remember. So, yeah, yeah. I can, and uh, and it was just them hanging about at a fruit and veg stall, chatting up a couple of young women, and they're, they're eating an apple or somebody's got holding a bag of fruit or whatever. And I just I just sat there looking at it for about ten minutes. I just couldn't believe how happy it made me to look at a picture of the Beatles I'd never seen before. And I think a lot of that is to do with the sense of place. You know, because he said in the caption, this is on whatever it was, Brewer Street. You suddenly thought, oh, my God, yeah, I could go there. You think how many times you've been to that exact oh, spot? Oh, yeah. And I get that time... in London a lot. I just think it was here that the last photo session took place. Or, it's you know, it's, it's here that there's that famous picture of John, you know. And it, that, that kind of childish thing of thinking they actually stood on this square of pavement. It's astonishing. And uh, and I suppose that applies to all those books, you know. They, they, you know the same thing applies in Bath or in Bournemouth or whatever. Other interesting Beatle book we've got. They really will do anything. Um including something like this. Uh, now, this is um, a collection of amateur fan-taking pictures from the Sgt. Pepper sessions. You can probably see the high quality of some of those on the front there. Um, I mean, it, it really is... I mean, you can see, you know, when you've got blurry, slightly strange pictures of, of Paul like that, you know. So these are people... These are them turning up at Abbey Road or... 
It's exactly just that. Just taken pictures. It was outside. an Instamatic, isn't it? Presumably. Yeah. 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 Come to yeah, the probably, probably before the days of the Instamatic. Yes, brownies. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. You know. There's a um a particularly fun subgenre of of Paul McCartney books. Um, where in the eighties there was what they called kind of airport reads. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, yeah, right. right. So I wanted to share a couple of those with you. Um, there's a particularly some quite interesting ones here. This one, uh, if you can see that McCartney songwriter, oh, right. uh, which came out in 1986, um, and has a particularly interesting closing line, which, which I'd like to share if that's okay. Yeah. Um, it, it says it ends with it talks about Paul's whole life, and then at the end they go to somebody that says Paul McCartney will go down in musical history. I wish you'd stop and give the rest of us a chance. And that comes from, that comes from renowned Paul friend fan, Francis Rossi of status quo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you've, extraordinary. you've also got this one, which is quite a fun one. Another, a, a Beatles podcast called your own personal Beatles. Told me about this one. And I had it. It's this one here. Um, Paul McCartney behind the myth. Um, Who's by, that written by? That's by somebody called Ross Benson, oh, okay. who wrote a book about George Best called The Good, The Bad and The Bubbly. All right. Oh, and yes. Famous we title. know where we are now. Go and, on, yeah. and, it, and the introduction says, Ross Benson is a close friend of many Beatles intimates and advisors, knows Ringo Starr and lists Bianca Jagger among his friends. <laughs> uh, and the man that's, for the job. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the qualification for Ross Benson to produce Paul McCartney behind the myth. Um, so yeah, there's that particular subgenre. Another fun one is Beatle conspiracy theories of which. Oh good. Oh obvious. go on, let's have some. So the famous one, obviously, is this one. Oh no, hang on. almost wrong there. Uh, the Great Beatle Death. Um, yeah, Death Clues. Obviously, Paul is dead. Um, Goes into some quite fun. Uh, some quite so there's a whole book about that, about yes. just the well, that one incident, the, the mad conspiracy theories around Abbey Road. Around Abbey Road. Yeah, yeah. Written by R. Gary Patterson. Uh, not sure who that is. How could you get more than a page out of that? I'm astonished. Believe me, I know. You know, I'm as astonished as you. Um, then you get this one, which is the Lennon prophecy. Oh, God. Which it says, um, da, 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 this book presents the theory that John Lennon may have sold his soul in order to achieve international fame and fortune and subsequently pay the ultimate price for his success. So at some point, John decided to sell his soul. Don't know when, could be Hamburg, could be, could be could, you know, could be the cavern, I've no idea. But at some point, yeah, he sold his soul. And uh, Joseph Nisgoda got, Got a got a book out. Got of an that. entire book. Out. Wouldn't you like to know just how many copies they sold? Of that? I'm <laughs> fascinated. I just cannot believe that more than half a dozen people, or, 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 or compulsive collectors like you, would have bought Although, it. Although you see, it could be one of those things. They are such a big brand that if all the if all the libraries and all the deep end Beatles fanatics get a copy, that's quite a few. That's quite a few. That's it true. adds up. You know, if you put yeah. the name Beatles on anything. Yep. You can you can sell some copies, you know. The same thing doesn't apply to Jerry and the Pacemakers, or, or even the Rolling Stones. You know, it just doesn't apply at all. I was thinking about this actually uh, this morning. I think it might apply. The only person it might apply to is probably Bob Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, mm. yeah. But, but Bob, uh... Bob Dylan doesn't have a as big a footprint as the Beatles, really. You know, it, it, it doesn't touch people's lives in in the same way as the Beatles because yeah. people can always measure themselves against the Beatles and the individual Beatles and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. It's and very... the difference between the two is the Beatles you get kind of facts whereas with Dylan yeah. you, you you don't really ever discover anything more it's just more kind of mystery isn't it more folklore. Yeah. yeah yeah yeah. What's the best one in your in your view? Well, uh again I'm I'm glad you asked. Um it's well there's kind of two really. So this mighty tome, Mark Lewison's original recording oh, yeah. sessions book. Um, obviously, you know, you, you know as well as me, Mark's thankfully working through volume two of his wonderful trilogy, um, which uh, hopefully at some point will come out. Um, but yeah, this again, I bought this one I was about 13, 14. Um, it just, it, it tell, even though it's quite factual, it tells you, you know, when they recorded and what they recorded and how they did it, you know, that 
there's enough magic in these pages that, that brings the music alive that, that and then when I listen to it again, having read this, it kind of sounded different. You know, you can hear Ringo slapping a suitcase on. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I love her. Oh, yeah. Once you hear those things, you Once always look you out hear- for them. I can only recently discovered when I read yeah. uh, 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 George Mar- a book about George Martin. It must be Kenneth Womack's book. Kenneth Womack, yeah. Uh, that he pointed out that there are bongos on a hard day's night. Mm. And once you're told there are bongos on a hard day's night, you can't unhear them. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's and like I- finding out that Lady Madonna is based on Bad Penny Blues by, by Humphrey Littleton. Listen, once you've heard Bad Penny Blues, you just think you just... You, you hear it in your head every time you hear Lady Madonna. It's yeah, the same yeah, song. yeah. So there's that one. Go on, we're, we're going to say the other one, one is now. This is a slightly uh, maybe controversial choice. It's this Paul McCartney's book many with Barry years. Miles many years oh, from now. Oh, right, okay. okay. Now I love it because I mean I'm a Paul. I tend to you know vote for Paul it, <laughs> when it comes to favorite Beatles. Um, and what's great about this book is. Through the 80s, as you know, as you both know incredibly well, his stock wasn't at its highest. Uh, things like Broad Street and, uh, you know, albums that press to play weren't particularly well um, received. And obviously he was still alive, which obviously John wasn't. Uh, so even though that book, which comes out in 1997, it was accused at the time of him slightly feathering his nest a bit, um, where he, you know, he kind of came out and said, I'm the avant-garde Beatle. And I-, I was out with John Cage and... Uh, while John was... But John you know, was sitting in Tittenhurst Park, yeah, watching telly. That's exactly, right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But the thing was, he was that thing. You know, he he was going out and watching plays and you know, osmosing all this stuff, which he then brought into the studio, made all that wonderful music. And I think Paul's voice needed to be heard at that point. And I think, really, if you think about it, since then, his reputation has only gone on the incline, you know. Um, You know, I mean, the excitement around that album announcement that came out last week for McCartney 3, you know, you you probably wouldn't have got that in 1987. I tell you, it's really funny, you see, because I noticed this, and I noticed this via social media, through people like you and uh, and the guy who does I Am The Egg Pod. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. And people talking to people like Peter Phoenix, as we did, you know, in Word of Your Ear, uh, back in March, I think. I think Pete made the point that it was only when John Lennon died that he realised he realised that John Lennon had been in the group with Paul McCartney. Isn't that That's right, Mark? Right. Did he say yeah, something he was, like yeah. that? He just knew more. Paul McCartney was the, was the leader of a group called Wings. And then very slowly he worked it out in reverse. <laughs> and he said, I can't believe these two guys actually ever knew each other or were, were in a band together. It's amazing. Mm. It's much like you, you know. He was repiecing it together from as a bit yeah. of history. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, there's a, and there's clearly a whole load of you doing this. Is that the case? You know, the, I am the egg pod. Who's the guy who does that? Uh, that's Chris Shaw. Chris Shaw. Um, yeah, he. I think you spoke to you. Did I, one, I, though, I did, suppose yeah. you spoke to Chris Shaw yeah. a while back. Yeah. Yeah. Fans on the run. Is there one? There's a fans on the run. I've been on that. Yeah. So I yeah. do. I mean, what I do, I, I on the back of the Instagram page, I do a, a podcast, which is somewhat unimaginatively called the Beatles Books Podcast, um, where I speak to authors about, um, you know, often upcoming books, um, but also, you know, older books, just to get to the idea of, as, as we said at the start, there are a thousand of these things and people still decide to write more of them, you know. <laughs> um, and that that's quite an interesting concept. So I try and work out, you know where they're coming from and not speak to them about the Beatles obviously um I spoke to uh your old friend yeah Paul DeNoyer, Paul DeNoyer the other day. that's right yeah. um who, and Ken uh, Womack too and Ken and yeah I've got quite a few others uh lined up which is good but yeah Paul was saying in his one that when he was at the NME in 1979 they had to really twist his arm to go up and interview Paul McCartney they were like oh, you know I know you don't want to do it Paul but uh <laughs> you might have to speak to Linda as well um, <laughs> um and Paul DeNoyer was like oh, great yeah fantastic you know, and I, I, I think he they tried to sell it to him, the enemy, by saying, you can see your mum at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, as you know, is from Liverpool. But you forget, in the no, 80s, absolutely. as Dave was saying, they were kind of, their, their reputation was very flat. We did a thing on Cube 20 years ago today from Sergeant Pepper. And actually, it was very unusual to get mm. excited about the Beatles at the time. Well, didn't you put McCartney on the first cue? Was he yeah, the one? He did. Was he was. First cover. First cover. Yeah. Right, yeah. and, and that was very, that was... Um, you know, I don't know if it's calculated or not, but that was certainly instrumental in in that that in, that kind of change in people's perception of him that right. you referred to, because yes. he really did talk about that. Uh, yes, you know, his uh, interest in the avant garde and so forth. And it's uh, a, a famous interview that he did. I, I've always wanted to ask you. I don't know if you were involved in this. I think the guy's called Chris Sal 
Salovich. Salovich. Yeah. Yeah. He, he did that that first interview. He did that first interview. That yeah. was for cute. Now that's they a talk pra- about trepanning, don't they? We're having the head, the whole board in his head. That's right. Yeah. So now somehow the original tape of that got out i don't know how um and that's on youtube and you can listen you can hear like the kettle going and paul's making chris these t- you know cup of nice cup of tea um and that's a fascinating interview because it's one of the real open interviews that he gives now you get a lot more you know you both know quite stock answers from him but yeah. at that point he speaks quite openly about you know him and yoko and um the relationship he had with john before he died and stuff so yes yeah, you know that that first issue of q i think was was definitely contributed to the that you know well, i suppose it was the first would he be one of the first interviews that he where he, could, he was no longer expected to mourn John Lennon? You know, that that was Absolutely. no longer the, so he could say, All right, this is and this also is one of the view. first way he talked about his the past. I mean, that became a format for that magazine where people uh, up till then had mostly been talking about the present and the new album and all that. They actually right. talked about their entire trajectory, mm. and that was really interesting. Mm. And obviously, they really wanted to do it too, yeah. Yeah, but some, somebody really should write a book about the Beatles. Almost, I know people have written books about the Beatles after the Beatles. Mm. But it's more. What's interesting is is the is the rising stock of the Beatles, right? And the periods when it goes flat and then it rises again, or whatever. You know, we tend to think it's inevitable, but it's not really. You know, and I, I think a lot of that was um, was quite shrewd marketing, actually. It, well, it, around the anthology, because if you look at the reissues that are taking place, you know, come along in the seventies and eighties, they were pretty shabby, weren't they? Very Mark? shabby. They were. I mean, the, the real genius behind all that was Neil Aspinall, who yeah. really deserves the credit. Neil Aspinall, their original roadie, for God's sake, the driver of the van, you know, went on to be the CEO of Apple, and he his his, his strategy to get all that stuff together and and, and 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 keep them in the kind of commercial frame, and he did a brilliant job, absolutely mm. amazing. Mm. But it's yeah. the idea of just, just really restricting everything for a while, yeah, and and then putting it out there, yeah. And uh, well, in the year that the first anthology came out, whatever year that was, ninety ninety five, ninety five, yeah, wasn't it EMI's biggest album that year? I think it was something yeah. like that. Yeah, there's an interview that Paul did around did around that time where he said, um, I think in '96, on the back of the, all three of them coming out, he said, you know, finally someone's come along that's bigger than the Beatles, yeah, and, it's, it, and it's the Beatles. <laughs> it's, it's, so you know, there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of yeah. truth in that. So yeah. what, what what's your um, what's your most recent acquisition of a uh, of a Beatles book? Well. Um, I, I slightly put off getting. No, I don't know if you both read this. I'd be intrigued if you had. Is this? Oh right, one oh, terrific. Yeah. I well, love it. Do you? Interesting. Well, yeah. I, 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 uh, one of the perks of doing the Instagram page and, and the podcast is that um, publishers very kindly send me copies yeah, of yeah. forthcoming books that I can then publicise and, and spread the good word about. Um, so th- that one, I have to confess that that was sent to me from right. the night the night people at four state at uh, four state books um it, it we all say we're talking about the craig brown book here don't craig you brown that. one two craig three Brown's four, one yeah. two three four yeah now obviously craig brown not a beetle author not someone a lot of these books that i've got here um uh, were people that have become obsessed with the beatles and henceforth in a book about them uh so he comes at it from that kind of slightly you know non beetle fan perspective which i think is interesting you know he talks about going doing the, the tour of john and paul's homes in liverpool uh and the slightly sniffy reaction that he gets when he starts making notes and stuff you know um uh, so yeah it's an interesting book it's good sometimes it's good to kind of step back a little bit yeah, and yeah. not get someone that knows every take of every um you know of, of every single really book. fresh approach i thought really uh, interesting but I, I, I tell you Just what, tell how, all the stories isn't it? the funny thing about yeah. that book because mark and i were discussing that i think probably when this when this uh, lockdown first happened, weren't we reading that? Yeah, we, we, I think uh, we probably were. And um, yeah, because I was actually, I was, I was supposed to be reviewing it for um, whatever Saturday review, which didn't happen because of lockdown. And I was reading it slightly ahead of you, and uh, and I was <laughs> speaking to Mark and said, uh, I've, "I've read this latest bit." And I came to this bit in the book where he, he talks about the Beatles are playing, I think, the, not the Star Club, the Top Ten Club in Hamburg. Yeah, they're in Hamburg. That's right. 1961, I think And it in is. walks in Malcolm walks Muggeridge. Malcolm Muggeridge. Yeah. And I thought, I said to Mark, this can't be real. Yeah. This, this is Craig Brown 
indulging his kind of sense of humor, his private eye fictional diary thing. He's just put this in here. And I was saying to Mark, that can't be real. Mark said, that doesn't sound real to me. And I was, we checked with loads of people and loads of people said, that doesn't sound real at all. And I was about to write a review saying, if he thinks he's going to pull the wall over my eyes by saying that Malcolm Muggeridge went to see the Beatles in 1961, he's got another thing coming. When I finally managed to get hold of a copy of Malcolm Muggeridge's diary, isn't it? Took some doing, and I looked on the appropriate date, and sure enough, it was in there. So Craig Brown, by going into it, not being a Beatles kind of initiate. Mm. It's probably a strength, yeah. You know, when it comes yeah. to writing. Well, his method then. was just to go through and get other uh, kind of uh, memoirs, really, was it? By autobiographies by lots of famous people, look at the index to see if they'd ever met the Beatles, and then well, go back the, and retell that story. It's a brilliant idea. It was a simple. It's clearly the way that the Princess Margaret book was done. It have was. you read the Princess Margaret book, Joe? Yeah, that yeah I have. Yeah, which yeah. Is, I think it was. I thought it was great better. book. Amazing book. Yeah, yeah, great um, book. Yeah, yeah. But they're both. You know, they're both they're both good good in their ways. So traditionally on these on these uh, word in your attic, we ask people to finish by telling us what is the greatest record ever made. I don't know if it's a Beatles record. I don't know if it's a Paul McCartney record. Could be anything at all. The well, Ruttles. well, the the Ruttles. I, yeah, I forgot. Who, who can forget about the the Ruttles? Um. Well, I saw. I thought it's difficult for me to talk about the Beatles for the last half an hour. Um. And and not meant and not you know suggest one, but I have got a, a, another option. So, the best Beatles album. Uh, is this one. Oh, yeah. oh okay. That's the correct answer. Very good. Well, Dave and I are both enormously enthusiastic about that. That's the first one where every single song was written by, by the Beatles, wasn't it? It was no no cover versions. No George songs even on that one. Um, that's, that's true. true. Yeah. Simply because it makes me happy. Yeah. From start to finish, I start, yeah. I'm happier than when I when I was previous to me putting yeah. the, the record on. And if, I, if I'm not allowed to be, it was one, I think the greatest record ever made is this. Oh, uh, which, uh, spray. Yeah, okay, that's, which, a, that's a good choice, yeah. Which does the same thing, uh, massively underrated um, and just a wonderful, you know, uh, song book from start to finish. Paddy McAloon should be Sir Paddy, if you ask me. Right, right. Well, look, uh, it's been lovely talking to you, Joe. Thank you um, so much for having me on, both of you. Keep keep up the good work. So you're, you're continuing to post a Beatles book a day. Yes. Uh, and you're also you're also interviewing Beatles authors. Yes, many more lined up, yes. Uh, 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 we shall heavily plug both these things. Okay. Very kind of yeah. you, thank you both. So Not at all. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Great nice to, see to see you. See you. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.